All right, Mr. King, you are up. Let me go in here and find Covey and take his privileges away from him. Oh. <laughs> and give them to Mr. King. All right, sir, you are in charge. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I apologize up front. A crew is doing some utility work in front of my house. My dogs are not happy about it, so you may hear from them as well. All right. My name is Charles. I chose to do my uh, presentation on Adobe as a sustainable building material. Um, Adobe is an earthen material uh, found in select regions, usually uh, drier, hotter climates like the American Southwest. Um, and it's one of the older building materials used for permanent structures dating back to as, as much as 10,000 years old. Um, typically just made on a stone foundation and uh, in a uh, single wipe of low bearing wall. Um, then with timber logs run through the top course and either a thatched roof or a flat adobe mud roof and a predates kiln fired brick. And yeah, I'll get, I'll get into different formats that it was uh, used in. Okay, uh, adobe is a very low impact material. Um, traditionally, like I said, it didn't even use kilns. It's just uh, dried in the sun after um, after it's composed of a uh, soil and straw, um, put into wooden forms and then set out to dry for a couple of days and it's good to go. Um, it's especially low impact in areas where you can find that soil right under your build site because if you need to excavate to get proper water mitigation away from your house. Uh, the cut can be used to make the bricks that will go into the house. So it's a very low waste system. Uh, uh, sorry, Rupp, would you uh, close your design ideas tab on the right there make, so that it makes the window bigger? Yep, give me one second. It's hard for me to see. I got, is that better? So, yeah, that helps a little bit. You could hit slideshow too and we'll only see the slide. Yeah, or F5, either one. Current slide. There we go. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. All right, obviously uh, nowadays they have uh, laboratories you can send your soil to to get it analyzed for moisture content and compressive strength and, and uh, figure out what all's in it. But um, historically, you would just make a mixture of in say a mason jar, one third earth and two thirds water and shake it until everything's evenly distributed and saturated, let it sit overnight. And then the next morning after all the particulate is settled, you can get an idea of roughly the ratios of uh, different materials within your soil. Um, ideally you want about, for adobe building, about 15 to 25% clay, 10 to 30 silt and above 50% fine sand. If, if you have too much clay, it's prone to excessive expansion and contraction, should uh, crack the brick. And if it doesn't have enough, then that sandy particulate tends to uh, make it crumbly, not have very good compressive strength. And so you can see on this chart here, you want something between sandy loam and sandy clay. All right, here's an example of puddled adobe, which, uh, is how things were historically done thousands of years ago before they had innovated um, wooden forms. Um, and that's, that's how simple the building technique was. They would just carry one basket at a time of, uh, of mud, essentially, and, and then use uh, wood and leather floats or trowels to shape it and polish it and make the finished structure. You know, just went on one basket at a time. And Here's an example of more common adobe bricks. These would usually be uh, 
either eight by four by 12 or 10 by four by 14 for smaller bricks, um, anywhere from 25, 35 pounds a piece. Um, and specifically in American history, uh, the Puebloan culture used a uh, puddled adobe until the Spanish colonial colonists came and um, uh, they brought over wood forms and obviously they just, uh, you know, they, they didn't select adobe as a green building material. It was just what they had on hand. There wasn't sufficient timber or uh, lumber that was building grade and wasn't feasible to transport the materials they were accustomed to to, to the Southwest. So uh, adobe is what it was. And the cool thing about building with, uh, with adobe material is that there aren't a lot of different constituent components as far as the, the structure. It's not like you have to order different size bricks. You just, just like with concrete, you can um, mold it and adapt it any way you want to build a bigger form if you need bigger bricks and um, up, up to the size that it's feasible to move them. I've, I've read that uh, about the biggest that is common is about two feet across. And at that point, you're, you're getting into bricks that are about 100 pounds and not really feasible for, for building in the traditional sense anymore. Um, another noteworthy thing about Adobe is that uh, the mortar to put the bricks together and the interior and exterior plaster finish is made from the very same mud that makes the Adobe bricks. Uh, in the case of the mortar, that's uh, even to today, um, still use mud plast um, sorry, mud mortar because cement mortar would be too hard. You don't want your mortar to be stronger than your bricks. And uh, in modern applications, the exterior pl uh, plaster would have um, asphalt emulsion or Portland cement added in to stop water intrusion. Um, historically, you would just reapply more plaster every couple of years. It was a, an ongoing thing to keep, uh, keep the cracking to a minimum, keep the water intrusion down. <clears throat> and in between those two, uh, you have lime wash and whitewash, which people started to apply with a uh, you know, gypsum powder and lime to try to uh, weatherproof their homes. Uh, another interesting thing about Adobe is, despite it uh, being found all over the world in uh, indigenous communities, a lot of those build sites predate any communication between those civilizations. So it, it was just, uh, you know, that, that simple of an idea that everyone came up with it. You have on the left an uh, uh, enormous mosque in Mali, in West Africa. And then uh, the Mesa Verde in California, I'm sorry, Colorado. And those two alone are over a thousand years old. And then uh, there's a mission in Mexico and a mission in Santa Fe that's pretty famous, but <clears throat> it can be found all over the world. Uh, the biggest uh, sustainability draw probably of using Adobe outside of how easy it is to work with is that it has a large thermal mass. Sorry, there we go. Um, being that the walls are so thick and, and traditionally single, single wide, uh, it takes a long time for the sun to be able to penetrate. Um, so there's a little bit of a delay buffer between the extreme temperatures of, of daytime and the cold temperatures at night. So by the time all that heat is soaked into the stone over day, it's, it's nighttime and you have a radiant effect that helps keep your home warm. And the opposite effect goes into, uh, in a night, the cool air comes in through the uh, apertures and cools off the stone and you get the cooling effect throughout the day before the sun can warm things up again. And this is just another slide to um, demonstrate the longevity of uh, of Adobe structures. On the right is a structure called the oldest house. I don't know. If, uh, I hunted around a little bit. I couldn't find any documentation that it was actually the oldest 
um, inhabited house in the U.S., but it's from the 1640s, and it's been um, continuously occupied up until, I want to say, about 30 years ago when it was turned into a museum. And on the left is a, a Puebla uh, village in Taos um, that has been there for more than a thousand years. And outside of a little, you know, maintenance here and there, and and more plaster on the roof and on the walls, it's stood like that for that long. Um, again, this is what the backyard of an adobe property would typically look like. That's why we don't see them very often around here. It works a lot better in dry and hot climates. And you'll see uh, people adapt the building style in other climates, but it becomes less and less sustainable at that point because you're importing um, materials that can't be found in native soil cultures and uh, you're having to do so much engineering to make the material hospitable to the climate that uh, it's kind of uh, diminishing returns. Uh, here's a climate table comparing uh, Asheville where I live to Santa Fe, New Mexico. I just chose Santa Fe because that's a city that's famous for its uh, adobe architecture. And though there are similar high temperatures, you can see there's a larger temperature disparity between the daytime and the nighttime. And that's what makes uh, Adobe so attractive is it can eliminate some of the extremes in temperature between day and night. So if you, uh, your climate falls somewhere in the, in the middle instead of at either extreme. And similarly, Santa Fe versus Asheville, obviously we get a lot more rain than that area of the world. Um, and precipitation totals tend to be similar in whatever country's adobe architecture is popular in because it just sees more longevity uh, when it's not heavily treated in uh, drier, warmer places. In a modern application, outside of uh, traditional hot, dry climates, you'll see people use a lot of asphalt emulsion in their plaster. Um, having high foundations to try to keep keep uh, groundwater away from from the adobe brick, uh, large roof overhangs. So it, it can be done, but like I said, just diminishing returns trying to adapt it to a climate like ours. Um, some drawbacks of building with adobe. Obviously, it's a very heavy material even compared to, to working with, uh, with, say, brick. In larger adobe bricks, commonly 60 to 80 pounds, and uh, has a lot of associated manpower with every stage from production to transportation to uh, building down the line. If there's demolition and remodeling, it's, it's all heavy, hard work. So there's a lot of labor costs involved. Um, another drawback is the inaccessibility of the product. Um, should you try to build, an adobe structure in this area of the world, you're either going to have to source uh, um, sand, clay, silt from different mines in the area and compose the, the brick yourself um, in a more or less traditional fashion, or you're going to have to find somebody in the country, which is probably only going to be, you know, in the American Southwest to load up flatbeds and drive the material out to you. Uh, it's a pretty big associated fossil fuel cost. And uh, I read that an average Adobe house has about 5,000 bricks. So whether you're making them yourself or having them uh, transported to you, there's there's a large carbon footprint and labor so uh, cost affiliated. And another drawback is the maintenance uh, associated with building with Adobe. Um, most of these points here, you don't need to read through individually, but they are mostly to do with water intrusion and uh, cracking of bricks over time. Um, whether you're replacing, repointing uh, mud mortar or having to uh, support walls and replace entire bricks or just uh, add to the plaster on the interior and exterior over time, there's a larger associated cost than with uh, more traditional engineered products. 
Um, adding insulation is another uh, roadblock a lot of people run into if they're trying to build a historic style uh, adobe home. Like I said, the walls are all load bearing and they're traditionally um, single wide, so there are no cavities for that or sprayed or blown insulation. Um, so in cases like that, you would have to um, add a laid structure on the outside and, and rigid insulation before you plaster. Or, um, which is, and, and this is also the case when you're working with utilities and having uh, things plumbed and wired in, you uh, adapt that building style to have a two wide wall with um, a filled center so you can run your utilities. Uh, there's a pretty large associated cost if you're having a home built for you in uh, trying to adapt the traditional style to uh, more modern engineering and code standards and finding tradesmen who are familiar with the uh, building technique to be able to work their trades around the obstacle that Adobe poses. And last drawback I could find, they're very earthquake prone. Um, by having a, having large clay content, which I mean, can help with minor cracking because the clay warms and becomes more malleable and can fill holes itself um, that form over time, but it is still a brittle building material and prone to failure in earthquakes. So uh, to rectify that, modern engineering has people uh, reinforcing with plastic or rope grids on um, the outside of the brick and mortar structure before the plaster is applied. In uh, this case, you can see the, the rope binding on the right uh, roughly mimics the size of the adobe brick, so it's uh, helping to hold the, hold the mortar and brick in place and make everything a little bit more stable. And this would be in, in addition to, um, in modern cases, when they have two wide thickness walls with a cavity of uh, rebar and welded wire mesh reinforcements. Modern code also would stipulate that uh, there are heightened protections to the exterior plaster. Um, like I said, traditionally, um, cost and efficiency was valued more over longevity, so people would you know, go out every two to three years and add another coat of plaster onto their walls or their roof and, and keep the water off. But it's a uh, more costly in the long run to add a stabilizer like a lime or asphalt emulsion to uh, increase the longevity of, of the structure. Um, yeah, I already more or less went over that. Just a uh, Water mitigation is one of the, the most important considerations when building with Adobe because uh, water damage or water infiltration in through the, the porous surface of uh, the Adobe brick can lead, lead to rot or weaknesses or um, insect infestation. And it's so cumbersome to, uh, to remove brick and to, to rebuild that you have to be really cautious and make sure your foundations are high, your roof overhangs are, are good, and that your uh, plaster is without cracks and properly treated so that you don't run into those issues. I um, I personally think Adobe is, is a really aesthetically pleasing, really, really um, fundamentally attractive product. Um, it does have a lot of considerations to take into account. I don't think it would be a good idea to, to build an Adobe home in this region. Um, it's just not what the material was intended for. It becomes less and less green and sustainable as you move farther away from the area of the world where it was uh, sort of bastioned because necessary uh, cautions need to be taken to uh, make the material work. And at, at that point, your transportation and and labor costs become so high that it's it's somewhat prohibitive. But in parts of the world where where it does work, it's some of the highest longevity uh, structures that you'll ever see. And uh, 
a very low environmental impact. And yeah, that's about all I got. Nice, questions? It doesn't seem like it'd be very stable if you wanted to build like a two-story, although in the West I've seen them, the Native Americans did it. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could apply rebarb in that somehow like we do concrete. Yeah, I read that in a lot of uh, modern applications, they will leave a void in between two bricks and and fill with rebar and concrete. Um, but all the you know historical preservationists typically do not uh, advocate building more than two stories and they typically don't have a basement it's it's a one or two story structure essentially i i think i read that for every foot thickness of wall you can go 10 feet high so if you want to go higher than that you're talking about feet and feet of of wall thickness to make it stable and then to the top so what do they put in there for reinforcement what, I mean, is there anything mixed in with the soil? When they make the actual bricks, you mean? Yes. Um, well, historically, it would, it would just be clay, sand, and, and straw. So like straw or manure to stabilize. Um, and then it would sit in the, sit in the sun and, and dry out, and that's about it. But, but uh, in current application, I've read that asphalt emulsion is the most common thing to, to stabilize and stop water intrusion. OK. Okay. When you say straw, I want to, you know, a lot of times we think straw and grass are the same, but they're not. Straw right. is a hollow uh, reed type grass where mm -hmm. grass is a blade, you know, it's so you can't actually put grass into it. Uh, and when we, you know, we think about sort of straw versus hay, uh, when you use the term straw, we, we have to, you know, we have to worry about it has to be, should be bar barley wheat, that kind of stuff, not grass. So when we think about hay, so don't get that confused there. Um, one thing I want to I want to show, I was watching your presentation. I did a little um, I did a little thing while you were there. So I was looking at the two charts that you had here between Asheville and Santa Fe, and I wanted to put it in real time. So here is two inches of rain across through here. You you had this large size so we could see it, and it and I was thinking, wait a minute, surely they don't get four inches. And then it dawned on me that uh, you know, so let me. I'm not picking on you. I'm just. <laughs> I just want to make sure that everyone is understanding. So I've got two inch of rainfall right there. So you know, Asheville is way above Santa Fe as far as rainfall is concerned. <laughs> But not only, you know, rainfall, because adobe being clay, clay is very, very thin, very small particles, and they are susceptible to water. So, you know, you were saying it wouldn't be a good idea to put it here, and that's true because of the amount of rain that we have for sure. But what else is bigger, and I did some research on this while you're, and I, I was listening, I, I was listening, and you did a very good job. So here is, and I just pulled this up. Here is, look at this. This is the relative humidity of Asheville. Mm -hmm. All right. So the relative, even if it's not raining, you know, in January right now, February is between 60 and 56%. So that's how much moisture is in the air. I couldn't find Santa Fe, so I just went to Roswell. And look here. I mean, the maximum that it ever gets is 14 so mm -hmm. it's a very arid place. And so, you know, it, even if we tried to build it here, the moisture that's in our air here would disintegrate it. I mean, over time, it would just turn into to mud and we would be a problem, be very, very problematic. But I agree. It's, I mean, you know, looking at your pictures, they are, you know, these, these structures are absolutely beautiful, you know, um, and the stuff that you, this is probably my favorite right there, because you got a little bit of woodworking going on there and you got a little bit of, of, of adobe and stuff going on there. What do you think these holes are here for? 
ventilation drainage drainage there you go water drainage, drainage. Yeah. drainage. Yep. water drainage that's a, that's th this is called a scupper by the way mm -hmm. scupper very cool i like that looks good any other questions for for charles well again we have run out of